Welcome to uh, the online school. I'm Robert Watts, and uh, uh, Jeff and I talked at some length early on about the requirement for a, uh, a class that would explain, in simpler terms than people are used to seeing, uh, just what composition and staging was all about. Because it's such a vital thing to the whole production of any piece of art, from cartoons all the way to oil still lifes. Uh, everything has to have a composition and it figures heavily. And uh, uh, most of the books that I had seen, a wonderful book by Edgar Payne, but he loved to write so much uh, and he wrote so well that the whole thing got lost and he loved his pen and ink work so much that frequently you can't see through the forest to find the trees. And so, um, I felt that it was needed, and that's always been a bit of my strong suit. It's probably, I'm strongest in composition, I like to think at least. Um, so uh, I started out with this thing, and, and the first class that I taught in brick and mortar school uh, was a little shaky, and the pieces didn't quite fit together right. Uh, but over the last few semesters that I've taught this, it's started to gel, and I keep adding new pieces to it. So. Uh, what we, we generally start out with are avatars in the first iteration of the uh, composition class. Now, an avatar, it's really, in this particular case, a real simple thing. You substitute a rectangular vertical for a human figure, and you substitute primitives for the other important shapes, you know, lollipop trees with a ball with a stick on the bottom, and you find out where the shadows are going to go and what their size should be, and you arrange them as little tiny thumbnails in this way. And so that's the way the whole thing kind of starts. Real simple, uh, you don't have to be a fabulous artist in order to work through that phase of it. But once we get through the avatar stage, and it's not really something that you get through because you use it on every composition that you put together, uh, we move, of course, to the, the typical um, uh, motifs that uh, everyone has seen a lot of over the years. You see them in almost all of the Walter Foster books and, you know, and Edgar Payne's book and everywhere. Uh, a few I've discovered that were a little bit new, but basically the cir circle, the steelyard, the L, diagonals or opposing angles, you can think of it either way. That's the, that's one of the first group. I didn't put all of them in here because we don't need to go through the whole selection. You'll see them soon enough. Horizontals versus, versus verticals. You notice that the verticals are not totally, horizontal, totally vertical and the horizontals are not totally horizontal either. Uh, but that doesn't matter. The, it's the idea that matters. And it's the spacing and all that stuff that we tend to preach throughout the entire uh, course of uh, composition. Uh, there's a suspended steel yard, which really is the same as a steel yard, a big shape balancing a small shape or a small shape balancing a big shape. And the reflections in this case are almost more important than the original uh, creator of those reflections. This is a three spot. That's a real traditional. Those could be three figures. They could be three buildings. They could be three of anything. Uh, the S, that's one everyone's familiar with, I think. Uh, it's one of the first that you see. And it always acts as a very nice lead in to the subject whatever that might be, or an invitation to escape out into the unknown, into the background of the picture or the painting. These were, you'll notice this one, probably a lot of you from Lord of the Rings, it was where they set the, uh, set the fires on the mountain peaks and one at a time they would ignite and pass the message along. Uh, uh, well, all this was really about was this, this zigzag pattern that leads you ultimately back to this. And it shows how small the center of interest in a picture can be, especially if it's isolated, and uh, get your complete attention. Very important to have a center of interest, however. And most people, when they start out drawing, painting, creating things, forget to put that in. Or they have six of them competing for that honor. Uh, this one is a, a, a small light in the dark. Now there's a, a, a S-shaped road in here as well, but a small light in an overall dark background will immediately get your attention, uh, along with a human figure, which is another eye catcher. Uh, this one, you see a, an out of scale sign, a sign, a light, a figure, a row of cars and poles, which keeps the picture from falling out of the right-hand side. This keeps you from going down when you hit the bar sign. And this is the guy who's uh, ostensibly planning to rob the place, I think. Um, but um, we put these whole, I put these little cartoon-like sketches together. Uh, they typically take about 15 minutes to do. For me, uh, they'll probably take the beginner a little bit longer. 
um, the you tend to get into drawing big little tiny details instead of big things right away and that's the big problem we have to fight all the way through the course uh, this is a disappearing s which goes here and back to the center of interest which is that little farm in the distance and you notice this tree points you to that a lot of little tricks and things and people tend to forget to put shadows in their paintings that's the other thing that's uh, paintings or drawings I, I see I have taught a sketchbook class and it was amazing that people apparently were unaware of the shadow uh, at all they didn't know where that, that there even was such a thing uh, this one is linking that's one that I kind of came up with on my own I really haven't seen it advertised I've seen a few uh, in previous uh, discussions of the topic of composition, but you'll notice that there's a, a, a little pile of gobbledygook here, and it kind of, you, you, each thing overlaps or casts a shadow that connects them, and it's overlapping and shadows that link everything. As they go back into the distance, we keep changing the directions of things for interest. Uh, finally, we run out of identifiable things, and we have just your typical uh, backyard litter that and this is this all this stuff that leads you to that building so there's a nice big s that leads us back in there and this forms a, just kind of a nice background element to tie that whole background piece into one unit here we have little little uh, traces in the sand from water or whatever that leads you to him the shadow leads you to this there's a guy and this so all three of these principal objects are linked together in one unit and you notice that the wave is treated as a simple break in the uh, uh, in the color of the ocean so it works really nice in this one there's a really a, what you call a hard link and that's there's literally a line connecting this climber to the climber on top and the rest of these little zigzags are orchestrated so that they look like cracks in the rock but don't distract from the fact that we've got a real tension between those two elements. Uh, this particular case, um, the overlap of each of the figures against the next, slightly different poses all the way. These were all invented. I, didn't, I don't bother to look for reference on much of anything anymore. Uh, I mean, when you get to the finished painting, you've got to pose some figures and do it the right way. But at this stage, you don't need that. All you need is a really good memory and start paying attention to everything you see and watch the little things that happen that uh, uh, characterize certain things. Like, uh, you know, I had, I had a class actually draw a fire hydrant, and that was really pathetic. Uh, it was like no one had ever seen one before. Uh, so you walk through life, most of us, and uh, you really don't see too much. So anyway, this... Uh, this figure who's ambivalent, the rest are tied together, he thinks he's the second in command, and then we've got the main guy at the background. So this whole thing leads us all inexorably to him, and he's all in shadow to make him all the uh, more uh, ominous, uh, mysterious, all of that. This was overlapping, just plain overlapping. Each one of these little sections we spend an entire um, uh, session on. Uh, this T piece, obviously, basically it's one, two, three, four, four triangles, and I managed to get away with an even number. And uh, uh, there's a larger, a smaller, a very a much smaller, and then a really tiny one. And we got a few uh, enigmatic figure silhouettes. Uh, that's the thing that you really want to start focusing on is the overall silhouette, this shape here. That's really important. And then the shadow from another TP on this starts to help us with defining form. So you have complete control over where this, the light is coming from. So you work that out. Uh, this, is a, an in, this is an industrial complex, and it's largely composed of primitive shapes. By primitives, I mean spheres, uh, cylinders uh, with rounded tops, in this case, boxes, a bunch of boxes, and lots of overlapping in different ways here. And you're looking again at the overall silhouette of this whole shape here then and you could fill that whole thing in in black and you would still know that it's an industrial complex and that's the key to uh, a, a good design is the fact that it will read as a solid black uh, you get in the habit after a while of of doing these things uh, uh, on the fly uh, purely instinctively uh, the direction of the sunlight was important to see who could cast shadows on whom and who couldn't. Many times it's a good idea to do a simple silhouette with a few little forms in it and then put a piece of tracing paper over the top and try different directions of light until you're happy. This we've got complicated weeds uh, handled very cartoon-like. Uh, uh, lots of zigzags here, uh, but there's a, a, light, a dark, a light, a dark, a medium, a light. 
Uh, here you can see even no matter how good you are you can make big mistakes uh, you notice the corner of this box car is right in line with the corner of the building I almost got through this thing with a total victory but I blew it right there the, this thing should have been slid forward just a hair to to clear that you don't want tangency so that's another thing that I harp on continually throughout the course but uh, um, this this Eskimo thing we're dealing with the white on white so it's a little tough you have to work the shapes out so everybody's overlapping somebody else and we have to pick our light source very intelligently on this or we end up with a problem and uh, so I I've done enough of this where I can I can usually get close the first time out but I still have to do revisions uh, I usually do these little things on a very cheap lined pad that you can get at any of the office supply stores I buy them by the dozen and you scribble on them very quickly you don't care if they come out really terrific you start thinking more about the overall feel of the thing than little details and you, the paper already looks terrible so you you can't ruin it um, and and it's cheap on top of it all and then once I have a design that I think I like I put tracing paper over that and start to clean it up move things a bit if necessary so forth okay this was shadow and uh, it's also light because without the shadow we don't have light and vice versa um, and I was just looking for one of the one of the features of a shadow is that it can hide stuff that you don't really want to pay attention to that's an old axiom in movie making if you don't want to see it don't light it uh, works really good and so we've got another figure back here just barely visible and this one only slightly silhouetted the flashlight obviously the key source a bright light there a less bright light there a little bit of ambient light from outside uh, and this this act these two dark shapes here act as bookends to squeeze our attention into the middle so uh, the thing that you will find uh, as you as you look at all of these is that they start to combine all of the ingredients that we've learned up to this point in concert they're working together it's just like an orchestra doesn't have just a bassoon uh, it's got uh, all you have to learn violin you have to learn cello you have to learn bass you have to learn percussion you know you have to learn piano violin i mean, just the whole list and uh, so you have to learn all of these things and put them together but you don't need to use everybody uh, you frequently do need to use four or five of them and frequently you'll have something like converging lines or radiating lines with an S influence and uh, maybe a letter J uh, into the thing as well so in this particular case this figure is totally blown out in the light this one's totally in shadow uh, and uh, these two are half lit and we keep we keep the whole center of focus right in that small area this is just a simple example of a dark against lights so that you can get uh, uh, you can get this thing to read uh, otherwise it starts to compete with what's going behind and now it's illuminated and it works really cool this is an example of casting shadows to break up otherwise boring flat forms that we don't really enjoy looking at now we don't know what's off the screen and so in all illustration you can you know assuming that it's not on the floor of Death Valley you can do just about anything you want off screen to cast a shadow it can be a tree it could be Godzilla it can be anything you choose so you 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 are in control but learning that you're in control takes a little time this is mood that's another one this is and anything that disappears into the murk has got mood uh, and you can see that that's a common trait in at least three of these this is a, a dragon of sorts uh, barely visible in the in the morning mist and uh, this is kind of Indiana Jones like and just disappearing off into the or Jurassic Park uh, this one uh, is basically a silhouette operation it's supposed to be a mystical enchanting uh, you know far away place and there aren't many of those anymore uh, but what's really important about this is the step gradation of values dark medium light very light and this is really important this little scattering of verticals in there of a of a rustic kind of d decaying fence that gives us some place one place for our eye to land in the picture in this one here we've got a mysterious light coming in from the right uh, gives us a little bit of mystery uh, we leaned everything in just to make things uh, you know it's an old Disney trick in the in the uh, animated films but it works really really good okay now here's one that I didn't show all the step-by-steps but you will see them later in the video 
And uh, I read a little a line of copy in a story where it said uh, uh, he stepped out of the into the clearing on the beach and not 30 yards away was an Alaskan brown bear. And that was the thing that we that was the task to to illustrate. So I did a whole bunch of little rough sketches. I don't think I put any of those in here. Pretty. Yeah, I did. Uh, uh, these were four potential views of the scene. This was, uh, by the way, uh, in the something, this is something I think, I think I have discovered, uh, is that if you are very high, as in the case of this, you are an observer. If you're very low, you're an observer. Uh, if you're at eye level, you are a participant in the scene. So you are part of the, part of the drama. But if you get really low, you're just watching. You're the, you're the GoPro camera. And so these are all just everything made up. Uh, I did look at a book on some bears first, then I put the book away and uh, just started drawing bears. And, uh, and it worked out pretty well. It turns out I've got a fairly good photographic memory, not perfect, but good enough to get by. Um, this is the part of illustration that I enjoy the most, frankly, is the planning stage where you're, so I, as a storyboard artist is probably my favorite calling, but, uh, uh, I like, I like getting it set up, but I don't really care to eat the meal at the end. I do it occasionally just for laughs, but, uh, um, but I, I think this, this stage being the film director, the director of photography, uh, is more interesting to me than than actually putting the makeup on and everything later on. So you can see these are all very different uh, framing trees on both sides. The bear, very obvious. The hunter obviously wanting to not be really apparent. Back here, the hunter not really apparent, but there's a silhouette we can read. Uh, and now we're out with the bear in this one, and it looks like he's going that way. This one looks like he's established eye contact. That's the most threatening of the bunch. This one you're not sure just yet. So anyway, that's kind of the way it all went together. And then we finally settled on, I finally settled on this one. Uh, in which case, the eye contact has been made. Trouble is about to commence. Telling stories is great fun but it takes a little bit of practice to get to the point where you can start moving yourself around in the picture. This is the last frame, and then I'll show you a couple of finished pieces. Uh, this was a, these were all the same drawing, and, uh, and this is done in the video, and I, and I add the shadows so that we get a completely different mood to the scene, depending on where the light is coming from and, uh, uh, and what's receiving the light. So you can get totally different feelings in all cases. I mean, this is like nice midday, even though this car, this is a bad part of town. Um, this car's got the trunk lit up and the door open. Those are things called adding interest. And we do a whole session on adding interest as well. Uh, so anyway, that this is all based on an early concept, which is uh, you have foreground, middle ground, background. And uh, you have dark, medium, and light and you get to play with where those go in those three re regions. And that's basically the way that works. So anyway, that's enough words about this. I'll show you a couple of these are little gouache sketch paintings that I did. This was one for Dracula's castle. And it was uh, a lot of fun to do. It's done on in, in, like I say, in gouache on an old piece of illustration board called Lintex. Great stuff. You can't get it anymore. Crescent made it. But uh, uh, in here, uh, I, I was working with some guys at, at uh, Rockstar briefly. And uh, uh, the first thing I noticed was that crooked front wheel that, that really added character. And one person said that looked like a stein of beer hanging on the side of the, the cart. So anyway, there's lots of these are bookends again, keeping the center of interest nice. There's one little light up here, which is much more. Uh, much more mysterious than more than one. So one is really creepy. Uh, this one was a, uh, a scene, obviously, it's a siege of a castle. And there's not much else to explain except that we have a shadowed foreground, which forms a foil for us to jump over. Everything was made up in this. Uh, I, I did find some reference on, on this horse, and everything else was faked. I figured that it was close enough that I, I better find out what a horse actually looks like before I 
get too far into this but it, it still wasn't copied it was uh, it was changed quite a bit in paintings like this I typically wet the entire board first so it's all damp and I work in the big th big passages of color really quickly uh, and most importantly things like smoke that need to trail away they become grievously difficult to do if you wait until the board dries then you have to do a lot of careful mixing and it turns out to not be quite as spontaneous as you would like if you look at these all these guys in here you find out that there is no there 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 are just spears and little highlights off their helmets that's about it uh, this one I'm hoping that we can get this all in the picture here I'll do my best to put it sort of in the same spot I tried this painting when I was about 30 years old and uh, and I quite frankly just didn't have it at that point and I mean I had great thoughts and great dreams but I wasn't all that good and uh, so it kind of went out of the back burner went in a drawer and laid there for another 30 years and uh, then I finally jumped on it again and this time I worked it out and had a little bit more ability in, in my uh, quiver of arrows and I was able to pull it off so this is like a, a little bit of science fiction obviously kind of uh, this fluttering whatever we don't really even know what it is it was but it was a lot of fun to do so anyway uh, the idea is to do all of these uh, compositional errands that we're going to send you on um, you don't have to get really good at it right away but I, what I want you to get out of this course is to start thinking in terms of all of these things overlaps uh, tangencies shadows center of interest uh, where you're going to uh, where you're going to put everything what kind of a design motif you're going to use to act as a skeleton to hold your composition uh, we did some really tricky stuff it's, it's all mine called alphanumerics where we take things like J's T's lowercase a's B's M's upper and lower case all kinds of strange numbers five three six and we do compositions based on those and uh, you'll be surprised what you can pull off with that so um, have fun enjoy the course you may have to do it more than once to really get this thing to fully digest expect to do that because all of us have to keep working year after year after year after year on the same stuff go back and read the same books again you see them with new eyes It'll all look different the next time. Uh, so uh, have fun, work hard, and good luck. Okay? Bye-bye.